denizens of the night. Welcome to another episode of the macabre, the terrifying. Broadcasting live from the darkened corner of your basement, I will be your guide through the witching hours. Tonight, we'll explore the strange case of a family haunted by a mysterious entity. Make sure to keep the lights on for this one. This story is called, I Still Don't Know Where This Woman in My Driveway Came From. Written by Reddit user HoboJoe4. My wife and I were on our way home. We'd gone to dinner to try and work out some bubbling problems that we'd ignored for too long and tried to see if there was a way to salvage what was left. It didn't go great, and the ride home was uncomfortable. As we turned into the carport, my wife asked what if we decided. But before I could answer, the headlights illuminated a woman standing in the corner. Our carport is framed on four sides. There's a fence to the left, a shed wall in the back, and the house to the right. The only way in is through the driveway. This woman stood to the left of the carport, almost in the like corner between the fence, and scratching the at the air. She looked. Her head was slightly tilted, time. her eyes wide open, and her mouth ajar in a snarl. She looked like she was wearing a nightgown. Her age wasn't imminently apparent. Her hair was gray and her skin gray, but it didn't seem particularly wrinkled. As the headlights shined in her eyes, she had no reaction. She didn't blink or turn her gaze. She just stood there. My wife hit the brakes, and we both stare at this woman. We don't say a word to one another as we focus on this strange woman. Honk! Breaking the silence, my wife lays on the horn. I jump a little from the sound, but the woman never moves a muscle. We look at each other, neither of us knowing what to do. My wife tells me to get out and see if she's all right. I'm all for chivalry and being a man's man, but at that moment, I knew a stupid idea when I heard it. So instead, I rolled the window down and asked if she was okay and needed help. No response. My wife hits the horn again, and nothing. Neither of us wants to get out of the car, so my wife takes out her phone and dials 911. The operator asks for a description of the woman and our address. The operator tells her to stay on the line till the police arrive. There's a knock on the window, and my wife and I both jump. It's the babysitter. She asked why we were blowing the horn, and did we need something? I tell her to run back into the house and point toward the woman, but she's not there. The woman is gone. I asked my wife if she saw where the woman had gone, but she didn't. We would both turned our attention to the babysitter and didn't see where she went. I tell the babysitter to get back in the house and lock the door. The 911 operator asks if everything is okay and my wife tells them the woman has gone. The fucking operator asks if we still need the police. Of course we do. Just because we didn't see her move doesn't mean she's gone. My wife doesn't want to get out of the car, and neither do I. I try to look around the window to see if I can spot her, but it's too dark. My wife asked if she went inside while the babysitter was out here and we weren't looking. Maybe she ran inside the house. I think about it, but it seems impossible. There's no way she could have moved that distance without being seen. My wife thinks I'm being dismissive and gets pissed. I'm trying to maintain, but I lose my temper as well. And before I know it, we're having a full-on fight about the plausibility of if the woman is inside or not. My wife says to call the babysitter to check and make sure she and the kids are safe before the police arrive. I call, 
and the babysitter doesn't answer. I try again, and still no answer. I send a text and get no reply. Now my wife and I are getting nervous. I say, fuck it, I'm going in to check. My wife doesn't want to be alone in the car, so I say to come with me. She's not sure about leaving the car either. I tell her I'm going in the house, and she can come or stay. It's up to her. She asks the 911 operator how far the police are, and they say maybe five minutes, which sounds like an eternity, given the situation. So we both decide to get out and go inside to make sure everyone is okay. I tell her I'll get out first to unlock the door, and when it's safe, she runs for it. Great. I get out, reach the door, get the key, and open it. I glance inside and yell for the kids and the babysitter, but no one answers. I turn back to the car, and my wife is gone. I shout her name, but hear nothing. She's gone. The car door is still closed. It looks like she vanished. I yell inside for the babysitter and the kids one last time before I go back outside to check the car. I don't see anyone in the car. I turn around for the house, and in the headlights, I see my wife in the corner of the carport. Same frozen pose as the woman. Same body language, same expression. I say her name, but she doesn't look at me. She doesn't flinch. Nothing. I step closer to her, and there's still no reaction. I grab her arm, and she lets out this horrible, high-pitched scream. I say let out, because that's the only way to describe it. The sound sort of just emanates from her gaped mouth. Her face doesn't move. Her mouth doesn't tremble. She's still as a statue, with this horrible scream echoing out of her throat. I stop my hand and pull it away, and the screaming stops. I don't know what to do. I don't want to leave her alone, but the thought of the babysitter and kids not answering is at the front of my mind. What might have happened to them if this has happened to my wife? I tell her I'll be right back. The police are on their way, but I have to check on the kids. I turn and run for the front door and go inside. It's dark, with only a few lights on here and there. I shout for anyone to answer me. Where are they? Are they okay? But get no response. I try the babysitter's phone and can hear the ringing upstairs. So I run to the sound. As I get to the top of the stairs, all the bedroom doors are closed. Behind the kids' bedroom door, I can hear the babysitter's phone. I open it up and my two sons and the babysitter are in the corner of the bedroom. My two sons crouch on the ground, and the babysitter sits with her arms around them. They don't move, these faces of terror frozen in place. I shout their names, but they don't respond. I follow their eye line to the far side of the room, but I don't see anything. I run over to them, but before I put a hand on them, the same scream that emanated from my wife's throat comes from theirs. I stop, pull my hands away, and they stop screaming. I turn to follow their eye line, and I don't see anything, only an empty corner. I hear the sirens outside in the distance. The police are almost here. I don't know what they can do, but at least there's help. I look back to the empty corner, and there she is, the woman from the driveway. She doesn't move, same frozen expression and the same pose. Nothing has changed. It's as though someone picked her up from downstairs and carried her up. I stand and approach the woman. She doesn't seem to react. I notice my body tremble as I get closer to her. Everything in me says to run and get as far away from this woman as possible. But I keep walking closer. 
I match her eye line as I move toward her. I look directly into her dark black eyes. Inches from her face, I raise my hand as I did to my wife and children. I expect to hear that same guttural scream, but nothing happens. I grasp her arm. The woman's face doesn't move, but her body leans forward and her head stretches toward my ear. It seems like everything is in slow motion and I can't let go of her arm. I can't escape that snarled mouth as it leans beside my ear. I don't feel breath when she speaks. Her words come out as if from a single, long exhale. She says, My family now. I couldn't move. I looked into those cold, dead eyes, and the snarl on her face stretched and popped as it agonized from that stiff snarl to the worst smile I'd ever seen. She let go, and the room went black as I fell to the ground. I woke up to an empty home. I've been over every inch and can't find any sign of them. I've called my wife and the babysitter's phone, but it goes straight to voicemail. Right now, the police are around, pulling up outside, and I'm not sure what I will tell them, but I know they won't believe me. That story was a real scream, wouldn't you say? <laughs> if you thought the horror was over, however, you were sadly mistaken. I've just found a very interesting case file you might like to hear about. This story is called, In All My Years as an Officer, I've Never Seen Anything Like This, and is also written by Hobo Joe 4. Case number 03011984. Date February 8th, 2023. Reporting Officer Deputy Blackwell. Prepared by Deputy Blackwell. Incident Type Missing Persons, Possible Kidnapping. Address of Occurrence, 557 Maple Street. Witnesses, Julie Mitchell, Waitress, Stevens Bistro, 23 Caucasian. Philip Neiman, 911 Call Operator, 42 African American. On February 8, 2023, at around 6.45 p.m., Stephen Wilson and his wife, Carla Wilson, were seen leaving Stevens Bistro. It was reported by their waitress, Julie Mitchell. The couple were having a hostile dinner that included yelling and abrupt banging on the table. Miss Mitchell says she had to ask the couple multiple times to keep their voices down. Miss Mitchell reports that the couple eventually calmed down and finished their meal quietly, leaving the restaurant around 8 o'clock. It is presumed the couple drove straight to their home at 557 Maple Street. At approximately 8.23 p.m., a person identifying themselves as Carla Wilson contacted 911 emergency services. The operator she spoke to, Philip Neiman, reported that Mrs. Wilson stated in her call that an unknown woman was standing in her driveway. Mr. Neiman says he instructed Mrs. Wilson to stay on the line and in her vehicle. During their conversation, Mr. Neiman could hear Mrs. Wilson interact with an unidentified male, believed to be Mr. Wilson. At approximately 8.26, Mr. Neiman reported that Mrs. Wilson screamed. When asked what prompted this, she said that their babysitter, Miss Rebecca Wells, had come outside and startled them. Mrs. Wilson then stated that the unknown woman was no longer in sight. Mrs. and Mr. Wilson instructed their babysitter to go inside. Mr. Neiman said that the Wilsons had a private conversation that Mr. Neiman couldn't hear. It was at this point, 8.30 p.m., that Mrs. Wilson hung up. Mr. Neiman tried calling her back, but no one answered. The events that transpired from the ending of the 911 call 
and when I, Deputy Blackwell, arrived, are unknown. I came to the residence of Mr. Stephen Wilson and Carla Wilson at 557 Maple Street at approximately 8.37 p.m. I exited my cruiser and approached the carport of the Wilson's home, where the intruder was initially reported. On inspection of the driveway, I didn't observe any person or persons as reported to 911. I did observe an unattended vehicle, a 2011 Hyundai Elantra. I noticed the side door to the home was ajar. I announced myself and knocked on the door. After hearing no response, I entered the residence of 557 Maple Street at approximately 8.42 p.m. Upon entering the residence, I noticed no lights in the house and removed my flashlight. After activating my flashlight, I shined the light around the home's doorway as I entered the home. I continued shining the light about the house, but did not observe any sign of disturbance. I continued my way into the living room, where I witnessed five people seated in the living room. I once again announced myself, but again received no response. I approached the five seated people and announced myself a final time. As I reached the five seated persons, I observed two younger males, later identified as Bennett Wilson and Hutton Wilson, and two females, Carla Wilson and Rebecca Wells. The fifth person was Stephen Wilson. The five people were seated upright with their eyes and mouths open. I attempted to contact any of the five people, but received no response. I didn't observe any outward wounds or signs of distress on the people. I noticed that, except for Mr. Wilson, none of the other people appeared to be breathing. At approximately 8.51 p.m., I requested additional emergency services to render aid. After I got off the radio with emergency services, I attempted to contact Mr. Wilson. He seemed non-responsive until I shined my flashlight into his eyes, at which point Mr. Wilson screamed and attacked me. I was forced to subdue him. Mr. Wilson seemed confused about where he was. He kept asking who I was and where he was. After handcuffing Mr. Wilson, I stood up, and noticed the four other people were now standing up. Their mouths and eyes were open, and their hands were raised defensively. All of them shared the same pose. Mr. Wilson continued to scream, and I asked him to remain silent and to tell his family to sit down. Mr. Wilson insisted his family was upstairs. I told him they were standing around him. Mr. Wilson seemed confused and stated he didn't see them. I tried to make contact with Mrs. Wilson, but she was non-responsive. I became aware of a presence in the far corner of the room, an older, unidentified woman. I cannot confirm if she had always been standing there or had arrived in my subduing of Mr. Wilson. I shined my light on the woman and took a few steps in her direction. She remained in the same static pose as the others. I returned my attention to the Wilson family, who had all collectively turned and were now facing my direction. I removed my taser and instructed them to lie face down. None of them complied. I was unsure of how to proceed in the presence of minors. I backed up to keep the woman and the four people in my view. The woman had inched closer in my direction while I had moved my focus to the Wilsons. Since she was separate from the children, I instructed the woman to drop to her knees and put her hands behind her head. Mr. Wilson began screaming that the woman was not human and was a danger. I asked Mr. Wilson to control his outburst and remain silent. The woman refused to comply. I admit I had reservations about approaching the woman, given the lack of lighting and the unusual nature of the call. I pointed my taser at the woman and gave her a final warning to comply. The woman didn't move, 
so I fired my taser. It seemed to have no effect on the woman. I attempted another electrical surge with the taser, but my flashlight malfunctioned momentarily and went dark. I tapped the light on the wall, and when it came back on, the woman and the four people near the sofa had all gotten closer to me. I felt that I was being backed into a corner and attempted to use the taser a third time. My flashlight malfunctioned once again, but when I banged the flashlight against the wall, the light remained off. I dropped the taser and tried to get the flashlight working again. After a few moments, the light came on, and I was face to face with the woman. She was a foot from my face. The four people from the sofa also encircled me. They weren't moving and remained in the same frozen position. I removed my firearm and instructed them to back away. Again, there was non-compliance from the five people. I instructed Mr. Wilson to ask his family to step back for safety. Mr. Wilson again insisted no one was in the room with us. I told him to stop playing games if he wanted his family to remain safe. Mr. Wilson became distraught and said it was too late for that. I forcibly shoved the unknown woman away and raised my firearm. The woman didn't budge or react. I demanded she back away. Still no reaction. My flashlight began to flicker. I dreaded what was about to happen. The light went off, and the room went black. But then the yellow flashing lights illuminated the house as the ambulance arrived. I see the woman stare right back at me. With every flash of yellow, she seemed to move an inch closer in the darkness until her cold skin touched mine. The front door opened, and the lights from the ambulance flooded the house. I was temporarily blinded as my eyes adjusted. The EMT, Samantha Wayne, asked me to lower my weapon. I told her I couldn't because of the threat of the people around me. The EMT asked, what people? As my eyes adjusted, I could no longer see the woman or the four others. I told the EMT to remain outside until the premises could be secured. I again searched the house, but could find no sign of the woman, the Wilson family, or the babysitter. Once I determined the house to be secure, I allowed the EMT to come in and examine Mr. Wilson. He had become unresponsive. The EMT took his vitals and said he appeared to be in shock. Mr. Wilson was transported to St. Michael's Hospital. He's under supervision and has currently, as of this time, continued to be non-responsive. The whereabouts of the remaining Wilson family, Mrs. Wells, and the unknown woman are still being investigated. I told you you'd want to stick around and keep the lights on, didn't I? And was that just a deeper shadow in the corner of the room there, or am I imagining things? <laughs> if you enjoyed this story, please check out the author's work in the link below. Please also leave a like on this video and subscribe for more stories like this one. And whatever you do, don't fall asleep.